I think let's start out with what you do for work first. Um, so how do you use your platform to talk about environmental issues, talk about sustainability, climate change? Um, obviously, you're very active on social media, on Instagram. Um, so how, when you're in your day-to-day -day life, what conversations are you having with yourself about these are the conversations that I want to put out there? Um, sure. Being very intentional, because you are very intentional with your posts, which I think resonates with a lot of people. Um, but there is some thought process to that as well. Like what, how do you create the story or how do you create um, these posts to really, I don't want to say target an audience, but captivate them and bring them in to want to learn more. Yeah. And so I think a lot of us do not start out as environmentalists, especially online. Like that's not, some people, I guess, do start a platform or start um, a blog, a website to communicate strictly about this, but that was not my path. My path was I was a business owner. I um, built my personal brand around my consulting, my photography, and then mid-career or, you know, a couple, five, six, seven years into it, I had this giant awakening in my personal life. I became wildly aware of the crisis that our earth is facing, that we as humans, that our, you know, marine life, wildlife are facing. And I had to pivot. And instead of keeping personal personal and business business, I wanted to leverage all assets that I had to have the largest impact or the biggest ripple effect. So I knew that I had this incredible community of people online who were conscious and who cared about something. Um, if you and I connect, we tend to be more deep people, um, people who have intention in their lives or who want a better life or a more um, purposeful life. And so I knew that was at least the baseline. And so I shifted my language from strictly talking about being intentional with our lives, with our wellness, our food, our businesses, and you know, a holistic lifestyle to more in a specific direction of how do we view all of that through the lens of sustainability? Like how do we think of the end life cycle of the products that we're using or the detriment um, and I like to use the word impact as positive or negative impact. It's not all negative. So how do we kind of weigh into our impact and make sure that our actions are in alignment with our values? Perfect. Thank you. No, it's really, I mean, your posts, not only are they educational, but, you know, what really draws me into, because, you know, you scroll through your feed and then there's stunning photos and stunning video. And it's, I think, like obviously you have to have the aesthetic of it and to draw people in, but it always has so much weight to it because it's it's not just a photograph, it's detail and education in your post. And it's, I love them. That's what- Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, it, that's what I meant by leverage assets is because I think when, when we're young, if we care about the planet, we think that we have to be a scientist um, or a reporter or something that there's a very specific ways that we can participate when I believe that all of us can play a vital role if we use our skill sets that we already have. We don't have to like completely throw our career down the, you know, here we go, something different. And we can, if that feels like a calling to ourselves, but I think it's really powerful to use the skill sets that we already have and make them more powerful and, and use them. So photography is my language. And so I find it really beautiful to captivate somebody with a really powerful image, whether it's of wildlife, of nature, of a moment, something that captures the essence of this world and of this human experience that we're having, but then educate you beyond that. And so if all you look at is a beautiful photograph, then I hope that does something for you. I hope it inspires you. I hope it connects you in some way. And if you can stop and pause to read, to watch a video, to um, gain some sort of knowledge, then that's my entire intention and my hope for what I share and what we create. And you had a post the other day about talking about this duality of you're living in between worlds where you're educating yourself and you're learning from these people that have more of a, I don't want to say old way of life, but being more intentional with mm -hmm. their impact on the world around them. And then you're also, you know, you follow the fashion bloggers and the fast fashion. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that's something that a lot of people, especially younger people are facing right now in social media is that 
you know, they want to have purpose. They want to learn more. They want to educate themselves. But then there's still the draw of following these, you know, influencers or following these celebrities or you know, just these groups that don't necessarily align with that. So sure. can you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, I think um, so. There's a couple points that I want to make there. So um, this concept of sustainability and understand that like to sustain something means for it to continue on at the same pace for a very long time. So there are some things that we can sustain, but at the point that we're at right now, we are in a place that we need to regenerate. We need to put back in as much as we're taking out. And so this concept of regeneration or sustainability is not new. And I think that's where we're coming from as this younger generation that maybe not as much was passed down from this past generation. I think there was kind of a lapse of like plastics were introduced. There was a lot of, you know, convenience culture. We've just shifted so much technology. There's just so much, there's layers there. So we have almost disconnected that joint from where we are now to the wisdom. Um, A lot of it is from indigenous cultures. Maine is a phenomenal example of this, of Native American tribes who have so much to teach us whose land we are on that is across America that's here in Hawaii where I am and there are so many people that we can learn from and people who have never lost that connection so that's the one world that you're talking about of like I feel like I'm learning so much from prior like wisdom not necessarily like new flashy technology of like here's the latest sustainable swap it's much more deep rooted of like how can we actually live in harmony with nature because we are nature we are not above nature so that's kind of where I'm harnessing a lot of my knowledge at this point Um, I've created a lot of resources on my website or on my social media that shares books and and films to watch that people who are far more educated, far more in tune than I am. Um, And then to speak of what you're saying that we as a young generation, social media is pretty much like a 17 magazine online now, right? Like we grew up just totally plugged into these media sources that gave us a warped reality on our bodies, on how we um participate and communicate with one another how we buy how we just everything right and so now social media is that same place of um unattainable i don't even want to call them goals they're not that it's just this this facade on on um a surface level if that's all you're seeking that's all it can be but i have had a really different experience with social media i have learned so much from people that I'm willing to tap into their world, people who are willing to share their lived, their lived, lived experiences and their knowledge and their wisdom with other people, um, whether that's through writing, through video, whatever their medium is. And so I stress it all the time to clients, to peers, to friends, be mindful of who you follow. And some people that are watching this might just be like, I just want, I just follow my friends and family and that's awesome. But a large majority follow at least five, 10, 15 accounts that they don't know. So those five, 10, 15 accounts are speaking into our lives. And are they speaking something that's empowering and educating and something that's going to help us like move the needle forward? Or is it something that's going to make us buy more, feel less, consume, consume, consume? Because that's a lot of what I see. I was raised in Utah and it's a very consumer culture there. That's everything is your wealth, your status is defined by your outward appearance, what you drive, how, what your house looks like. And since living in Hawaii and spending my time in Maine, um, I went to college and met a lovely young man from Maine. And that's my connection there. And I've spent a large portion of my life over the last decade in Maine with people who don't care about that. They care about who you are as a person and what you stand for and what you wanna do with your life and how meaningful that is. And it's just taught me so many lessons from individuals, but also from the land, from being in such close proximity to nature and immersed in nature. So between these two places, um, it's almost like I don't even feel the connection to that initial, like how I was raised, that consumer culture of just nonstop breakneck pace of buy, buy, buy. And you're not enough if you don't do that really interesting. I mean, it is true because I was raised in Florida and that's the same thing where it's just 
you know, you have the house or you have membership to the yacht club, or it's just, it's the same thing, just different places. And Maine yeah. is very and special. There's, area, and it's, there's areas of Maine that are like that too. Like I'm not saying that Maine is like, <laughs> you know, far superior in every single way, but at least for, from our, where we were right in yeah. mid-coast, um, I always use the term salt of the earth people. Like Mainers are just, oh, I like love, there are so many people that are just never really disconnected from their roots who, whether they're still lobstermen or whether they're, they're oyster farmers or whether they're just farmers, like not just farmers, but like people who stayed with tradition um, are some of the people that made me look deeper within myself of like, why am I not like that? And and I just have such admiration for them and, and so much gratitude for the lessons that I've been taught. So for the people who are thinking or being a little bit more conscious about their consumer habits or being more conscious about what they can do, like, mm -hmm. you know, you always talk about the sustainable spots sure. and that's great, but that can only go so far. Um, how would you recommend to someone to kind of take a step forward in the right direction? Like what, can, what are three things that someone can do right now to, um, sorry, it just started like the sky just opened up and it started raining. Boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh my God. God. <laughs> sorry, that was, that was such a squirrel moment. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so the three things that you can do right now to take a step forward in the right direction of sustainability, rejuvenation, Yes. So if someone is taking in a lot of new information this Earth Month, if they are feeling called to do something, um, the first place I always tell people to start is to do a waste assessment. So what that could look like is um, counting the amount of times that you touch plastic in a day or collecting all the plastic that you use in a week and keep it in a separate bin at the end of the week, lay it all out so you can actually see it. When we see our waste, it's an aha moment. It's a light bulb moment. Um, and we can look at what the duplicates are or what we're using most frequently and find a reusable alternative. So that's, I think by taking in an assessment of what we personally consume, use, on a daily or weekly basis is the most foundational place to start. Because if I just tell you do X, Y, or Z, it may not fit your lifestyle. We're all so different depending on what region we live in, what part of the state we live in. So I would think just be mindful of what we, we do on our own. So start there. And from there, like I said, find a reusable swap for what you consume the most often. Um, a lot of that's going to be maybe a coffee cup that you're going to uh, you know, a chain restaurant each morning to get a reusable tumbler or make from home. Um, and then the other thing would be to shift your mindset from a um, waste mindset of just like, go, this needs to go away to how can I turn waste into a resource? So an example of that would be composting. Um, I highly recommend people composting, whether you're in Portland and you're in part of the city, find a, you know, a city composting facility that people do at community, um, in community, or whether it's in your backyard. Um, there are ways to do it no matter if you're in an apartment or you're in a house, um, but composting is huge. Uh, it, it eliminates methane from getting into our atmosphere. Um, coffee grounds are like one of the worst things to throw into our trash, um, but all of our food scraps can be turned into beautiful, healthy soil that can help in so many different ways. So I would say, waste assessment, composting. And then the third one would be um, looking into your buying habits in general. So whether you consistently buy single use plastics or whether you consistently buy fast fashion, um, wherever you're consuming a lot, look how you can buy less. And why I give these three tips is because I don't wanna tell anyone to go buy anything. I want people to look at how they can buy less, consume less, how that, in, that positive impact lowers our negative impact, right? I think that's such a huge important part because so many people think we have to buy our way into sustainability. They think that they have to go out and buy a reusable water bottle. They have to go buy um, you know, an alternative to paper towels or an alternative to something in your bathroom, which is great. But at the same time, we have to finish 
up everything we have, use it to the very end of its life, and then when we need to replace, buy better. Buy something that is reusable. But use up what you have and think how you can repurpose it. Rather than going and buying a water bottle, could you use an old pasta jar, right? Or um, rather than buying bamboo utensils, could you just use the utensils you have in your drawer and just take them to work with you? It's just more of a mindset shift than it is a purchase of anything. Um, it's just taking those steps within yourself, being willing to be self-critical, being willing to be introspective and be very honest with yourself of where am I wasting and how could I turn that into a resource? I love that. That was great. Oh, good. I mean, no, that was perfect. That was, yeah, it's, it's so true though. Cause I mean, even with the move is like figuring out stuff that I have. And then I'm, I have, um, different pots that I'm like, oh, like this would look so nice with this color because I just moved to this house and this room is this so like repainting things and just not going out and buying another planter pot because I don't need them or taking old jars and painting them. So it's been yes, really Look at that trash to terracotta thing I did. That was so yes. fun. My that sisters was... made so much fun of me. Amy and Jules were like, how was your project? And I was like, all right. I loved you know it. What? It looks so good. It looks awesome, especially looks so a really big one. Like I want to yes. find a really big one. So it looks like European or something, but it's, there's so many ways to repurpose things. There's so many ways to participate and to really get involved without going like across the world and trying to like to save the world. Like there's so much power that we have within the four walls of our home and you know, how we, how we participate. I think it's so huge. We have so much power as individuals and we just, push it off and say, we want to wait for, you know, corporate or for governmental, you know, intervention. And I think those are super vital and really important, but there's something to be said about taking action today in small ways that add up because what we do matters and it ripples into our friends, our families, our communities, and then it becomes a giant wake up, you know, a giant awakening for us all. And is there any recommendations that you would have for, because the whole point of these segments that I'm doing this week is to start the conversation because sure. in order to make a change, you need to start talking about it. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of my friends didn't even know Earth Day was tomorrow. And so it's, it's sad. And, you know, having these conversations. So what would be, because you have conversations every day, you know, you're on social media, you're um, talking to clients as well. If someone is nervous about talking about it or they're unsure about how to talk about it because sure. they think potentially that you know they're not the expert or they're not a scientist that they don't know the real facts um how would you say the best way to start conversations within our daily lives or at least be a little bit more purposeful with how we're communicating you know if you go out to coffee with your friends and they're like oh like are you bringing a cup? You know, just having conversations in our daily lives that move it forward. Yeah. Um, when we're approaching educating friends or family or just having conversations with them that might be a little bit uncomfortable, I think the best place to start is number one, by educating yourself. So reading and watching films and doing things that expand your brain um, so that you do have information that's fun to share and you can share those resources with them but also focusing the conversation on um, me or us versus you. There is something um, very inflammatory about, uh, I see this online a lot, but you should, you should, you shouldn't, you should. And that language is very accusatory. When I think we, us, our, this is our planet, we should be stewards in this way. Um, all of us can do this together. That's really empowering language. And so speaking from that, that perspective of this is all of us together um, unites people and makes people feel a part of something. And so they want to act, they want to do their part um, versus feeling like they're being blamed for something. So that's more online and in person, I would say, um, let them ask you, live in the way that feels alignment to you. So whether that is bringing your reusables, whether that is um, shopping locally for your food, whatever that looks like, whatever form that takes in your life, live it and live it excitedly and proudly. And when people ask, 
that's when it's a very easy opener into this conversation versus forcing your opinion um, or shaming or blaming somebody. Um, I find it much more of a lucrative conversation or a happy conversation when you just go about your day, you bring your reusables, you do your thing. And almost always there's going to be a, oh, why do you do that? Or, oh, I've never thought about that. And then you can present information, present your point of view um, in a really honest, open way, which I think is going to come across much stronger and um, be applied much quicker than anything that's blaming, shaming, or pointing fingers at people. And one last thing, because I don't want to take up too much of your time. Mm -hmm. um, so this is going to, I, our show got completely torn apart yesterday because of um, NBC special coverage. So we weren't able to run anything. Um, so I had to like push everything a day um, forward. And, and that's okay. So I want you to know that like, I say this to people on um, who do media online. I yeah. don't know about television, but something that is powerful, I'll just plant a seed. It might not be this year, but next yeah. year, there is something powerful about having the conversation after everyone stops screaming. Because everybody and their brother comes out of the woodwork on Earth Day and they're like, look at me, I care about the planet. Let's have this conversation. And then it's like crickets for the rest of the year. So those of us who champion for Earth Day and for Earth, for Mother Earth and for all of us, for humans and animals and everything, it doesn't matter that it's the day after Earth Day or the week after Earth Day. It doesn't matter at all because we are still here using our voices to create change, to open people's minds and to you know cause action. And so if it's the day of, it's the day after, if it's next week, it doesn't matter. Um, there's something powerful about like, last week was Earth Week, now what? So I gotcha. feel you. Thank it's you. Okay. And that was Whenever literally goes, just, it's gonna be powerful. You just answered my question without even like me oh. asking. That was literally what I was saying. So I've had to push everything like one more day. So today we're doing uh, Google Earth, climate change, showing how the satellite imagery is changing through the It's years. so sad. It's so sad. And so uh, our meteorologist is going to talk about that. We're doing cool. the breweries um, today. And then tomorrow, we're debunking conspiracy, talking yep. about like um, the film itself. We talked to scientists about the actual yep. accident. Um, and are you still giving it somewhat of clout, like at least a little bit? Or are you completely debunking it to the point of like, don't watch it? No, 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 no. They're they're saying it's good to good to watch, but there are some errors in it. And so oh, we yeah. talk about yeah. like and it's hard because if you were in like Minnesota or like Iowa, I'd be like, don't do that because it's so important. But in Maine, like yeah. you're a coastal community that absolutely thrives off the fishing industry. And I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that's not awesome about it in all reality, but um it makes a lot of sense versus people who are in like I don't know, Oklahoma eating sushi on a weekly basis and eating salmon nonstop, like those people need to watch that. Yes, exactly. So we're gonna, we have that and we're gonna talk about, um, I think like microplastics, plastics, like cleaning up um, when you see stuff, like kind of normalizing picking up trash because nice. it's not a bad thing to do. Um, I, my entire family judges me every time we're on a family walk and I come back with like, Oh, it's, yeah. Like, what um, are you doing? Why is everything, my niece does it now. And they're like, it's cause of Alana. I'm like. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, hey, if it rubs off on people, that's great. Because yeah, when you- care when she's old because of me and that's fine. Start looking like for it. You just find it everywhere. And it's like, you can't stop. Like There's some I, girl that, that went to high school with you that, um just wrote me like a couple of days ago when I shared like the last beach that we were on the head plastic and she's like oh we don't have that in Maine and that's the second time that I've heard feedback like that from people in Maine who um just assume that it's a Hawaii problem or like a Pacific Island problem and I'm like it's everywhere in Maine everywhere. as well and I it's think, everywhere um, it's, it's coming and that's not a good thing. It's not like a stay tuned kind of vibe. It's much more um, that just because it's not right in front of you doesn't mean it's not your problem. Doesn't mean that we don't all partake in it and participate in it because the microplastics that are ending up here in Hawaii are not just from us. They are from all of America. They're from Asia and they get caught up in these gyres and the way that the ocean currents swirl, they get deposited on our coastlines and so that was my aha moment of like 
oh my goodness, this is my trash. I may not be littering it. I may not be dropping it. But um, once you look into how ocean travels through our rivers, through our lakes, um, waterways, wind, like it's a natural world that's all connected. So it ends up in our oceans. And then it's, you know, getting baked by the sun and cooked in this lovely salt soup that we have out in the ocean. And then it's deposited here. And mm -hmm. so that's how, um, how microplastics end up here. But I think a lot of Mainers just assume that it's not there and it's not affecting them when very much so is um, all the seafood that we eat are eating it out in the ocean and then we're eating that. Um, it's just a multi-layered thing, especially like out on the archipelago, all the like the 4,000 islands off the coast of Maine. Um, there's like research vessels that go out there and study the marine debris because it's so intense out there. The amount of um, large pieces of like fishing um, equipment, but also just human like consumer waste is ending up on these islands because they're out there and they get in that same kind of gyre swirl that it all gets deposited out on those islands. So maybe we don't see it on every single one of our beaches, but there's certainly trash on every single beach. Every time we go to the beach, I go home, I come with like a cooler of, you know, drinks and things and I leave with a cooler of trash like every time I'm there. And it's certainly not our trash. So, I mean, it is, but I mean, like, it's hard. It's hard to have people think that um, it doesn't affect them if they don't see it personally.